Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to our audience, wherever in the world you are. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this book session on the book, The Globalization of Legal Education, A Critical Perspective. Um, I'm uh, MJ Durkee, I'm Allen Post Professor and Associate Dean for International Programs at the University of Georgia School of Law. I'm also Vice Chair of the ACIL International Legal Theory Interest Group, um, which is a co-sponsor of this session. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce a fantastic group of scholars here to present and discuss the book. Um, we have the book's co-editors, Professor Gregory Schaefer, Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. Greg's a leading expert on various aspects of globalization and world trade, uh, which he takes up from a really explicitly multidisciplinary perspective and publishes in award-winning books and articles such as this one. Um, he's also currently, as many of you in the room will likely know, uh, the president of the American Society of International Law. Uh, the book's co-author, Professor Bryant Garth, is also with us today. Bryant is the Distinguished Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of California, Irvine, where he, is also, where he also co-directs the Center for Empirical Research on the Legal Profession and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society. Uh, Bryant's scholarly expertise centers on the legal profession, um, very apropos to the theme of this book, uh, and the sociolo sociology of law and globalization, and he's currently on the executive committee of the first longitudinal study of the legal profession in the United States. We also have a chapter author here today, Professor Swita Balakrishnan, also from Irvine Law, a great representation from Irvine Law um, on this panel today. Uh, Swita's scholarly work, uh, in their words, interrogates the way in which law and legal institutions create, continue, and counter socioeconomic inequalities. They pay particular attention to the legal profession and legal institutions, as well as gender. And they're the author of the recent monograph, Accidental Feminism, Gender Parity, and Selective Mobility Among India's Professional Elite. Suita's chapter in this volume is really evocatively titled. It's called International Law, Student Mobility and Context, Understanding Variations in Sticky Floors, Springboards, Stairways, and Slow Escalators. I can't wait to hear about this one. Um, so our discussant today is Professor Rizwan al-Islam, who's professor at the Department of Law at North South University in Bangladesh. He's a prolific and award-winning author of scholarly works focused on international economic law, uh, specifically economic integration in South Asia. And I would also like to mention that Rizwan is the organizer of this event in his capacity as co-chair of the Teaching International Law Interest Group at ASIL. So thank you very much, Rizwan, for uh, bringing us together today. So the book is hot off the press. Uh, it just dropped from Oxford University Press in July. I believe that um, Wes will be um, putting a link to the publisher's page in the chat box in just a moment. Um, but it features 15 chapters from a wide variety of experts. I actually think there's a couple more chapter authors in our very full room here today. Um, uh, and um, these are not just UCI law professors. I think this is worth mentioning. Uh, it's, a, it's a diverse uh, group of folks. Um, and the editors point out that the authors come from nine different countries. Uh, the book takes a critical perspective, um, trying to unearth and assess the lurking power dynamics that are involved in the transnational spread of institutions and practices of legal education. So um, I'm sure you're all excited to hear more about it. So without further ado, let's get into the meat of the session. Uh, it's a webinar format today, which I know can be a bit isolating from the audience side of things, but this session is really meant to be interactive uh, and we wanna leave plenty of time for discussions and questions. So please do use this Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, to send in questions because we're gonna leave time for them and we really do want to engage with them. Um, so don't hesitate to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the co-editors, Greg and Bryant, to tell us a little bit about the framing of this project. Great. I'll go first, um, and then I'll be followed by Bryant and then Sweta. Um, thank you so much, MJ, and thank you, Rizwan. Um, it's uh, it's really a pleasure, and you know we were very grateful for you to put this on now that the book has just come out. Um, and it's great to see the two interest groups uh, co-sponsor this, because you know, legal education is about is about framing about how we see social problems, legal solutions, and 
and approaches to these the the, the construction the, the understanding of these problems. And so it's natural to bring both a theoretical perspective and an educational perspective together, and to do so um, given the the. the the focus of the three of us and who are presenting today in, on empirics. So the book is on the globalization of law schools and, uh, and uh, law schools generally. It's it's a book, it's the first time uh, in all of our books that it's, at least for me, um, it's an open access book. So it's available for free to download from the OUP website, um, which can be put on the chat. Um, the introduction is also on SSRN. Much of the common patterns that we see for, uh, of in global law schools or law schools that purport to be global law schools is what we would see in the United States and we view as very positively, at least from a, a, um, a progressive perspective. Much of this uh, focus is on cross-disciplinary scholarship, the attention to policy implications of law, attention to the transnational and the global um, and the understanding of law and legal change, and the role and importance of legal clinics to focus on real life practice. Um, our approach, much of the existing, it contrasts with much of the existing literature, most of the existing literature is normative regarding what law schools should do along these lines. Our approach, a critical perspective, um, is that we, we cast an empirical lens. It's to ask, where did these legal education models come from? How do norms regarding what is good legal um, educational practice, how do they circulate? Um, we note that the US became the most important player and that economic and corporate globalization is a major part of the changes that we, uh, we assess. We don't take sides regarding normatively what is good and bad in this, but we do study the phenomenon so as to open it up to better normative analysis and to show the inevitable compromises involved in changes in legal education. So the core of the book, as MJ noted, are, are 13 case studies, which we divide into three parts. Uh, so the first part is on tr uh, transnational processes in the reform of legal education around the world with studies on the history of the Ford Foundation's efforts globally, uh, studies in Africa, India, Asia, and Latin America. We then look to uh, the, we have different chapters on particular quote, global law schools. Uh, one in Brazil, one a new, the first law school in Bhutan, where did it find its models for what legal education is? Um, in one in China, uh, in YU, and a transnational consortium founded by Georgetown. And the third part is about trans, our chapters on the transnational flows of students, professors, and judges, uh, which in turn shapes the study, for example, of international law and the sort of constitution and the structuring um, and the personnel of international courts. The introduction starts with quotes from websites from law schools that purport to be global law schools, and, and it shows how they market themselves. It takes from Hong Kong, Singapore, Melbourne, Bucerius in Germany, Sciences Po in Paris, Jindal in India, FGV in Brazil, King's College London, NYU, and Stanford. After we then sort of trace the sort of the history of the globalization of legal education and the history of empire. We present our two, we present the Bryant's and my two complementary analytic approaches to studying this phenomenon to address the interaction of the transnational processes and domestic settings in the field of legal education. So I'll talk a little bit about my theoretical framework um, and sort of and Brian can talk more about his and um, sort of note how they complement each other. So the theoretical framework, which I've been applying over years now, is, refers to transnational legal ordering that can give rise potentially to transnational legal orders. It's a processual theoretical framework developed to challenge methodological nationalism in the study of law. It addresses the construction and flow of legal norms in ways that transcend borders. Here, legal education is different than what I've done before because legal education is not a legal field, but rather it's a reflection of and a mechanism for the production of legal fields. In the chapter, I note how the transnationalization of legal education can serve as 
um, it's both a symptom of the transnationalization of law, and it's also a mechanism for these processes. It can be a symptom, for example, when new corporate elites or other actors demand particular types of training of law students and new law schools work to meet these demands. It can be a mechanism for the conveyance of different conceptualization of problems and the appropriate legal response through exchanges of students, professors, teaching methodologies, and ideas. States and entrepreneurs may invest, and we see major business entrepreneurs investing in new law schools, as well as the refashioning of existing law schools, with an eye to participate in the shaping of these transnational legal order and processes, as well as to address domestic challenges in light of transnationally exchanged ideas and experiences. Brian's approach is on this, and he'll speak more about it, but just briefly, it's in the sociology of the legal profession. It's comparative. Um, it, it, it addresses the role of power, in particular American power and corporate power. Um, as the introduction notes, in the case of legal education, the reformers, for the most part, when they class with traditionalists in different countries around the world, tend to be more meritocratic and scholarly than those they target. Uh, they challenge legal establishments um, and they gain influence by aligning with emerging political movements and other powerful uh, agents that can benefit from the legal legitimacy provided. And this includes in corporate and business law. But what actually takes root depends in a local context. And Bryant maybe will be able to give some examples. Why don't I just say a bit about the sort of the main themes that we capture in the book and that we introduce in the introduction. One first, and here's the six main themes. First, that what we witness today is part of a longer history of transnational law, legal ordering. It's, it's to start an extension of the anti-imperial imperialism that begun, began in the late 19th century as the United States was becoming a major player in international affairs and struck and, and, uh, and stressed the importance of law. Um, second, the recent and more successful efforts to move legal education abroad into a new direction that challenged traditional local legal elites in Brazil, India, Korea, elsewhere. It comes predominantly from the demand side not from the supply side, especially as these countries deepen their connections to the global economy. Unlike the idealism of the law and development movement of the 1970s, which sought to create lawyer statespersons as moderate reformers, much of this recent transformation is about building careers, elite careers in corporate law and business law. Not only, but much of it is, is part of that which we address. Third, the changes in legal education um, oriented toward globalization depend on the way in which this legal revolutions emanating from the United States and how law is taught together with other allies around the globe interacts with local legal structures, local legal hierarchies, local political dynamics. Fourth, there's a core periphery aspect of these relationships um, certainly the relative core countries um, from the global north tend to be the exporters of sort of new changes or in legal education or practices and models. And there's a, so there's a tilt here in the production of what is imported and what is exported in legal education. The changes in global legal hierarchies over time occur, however, and they vary by regional context. And they vary by changes in domestic legal context, domestic legal politics, which may under, undermine the strength and prestige of the models at the core that are being attempted to be exported and imported. These transnational processes nonetheless help define what is a successful argument in legal debates? What constitutes the most influential, the best legal scholarship? What are the top qualifications for hiring legal scholars, legal professors? Fifth, the structural tilt is not inconsistent with the realistic, pragmatic, transnational optimism. The goal of many programs is to gain access to and harness 
global and transnational debates about legal education, transnational law, and legal reform. In order to play in the global transnational sphere, as a, for example, I'll just note the chapter on FGV Sao Paulo in Brazil, FGV Dereto, the dean there writes the chapter and stresses, it's not gonna help to ignore the hierarchies and pretend there is no such thing as transnational economic law or human rights law. Uh, to engage, you need to build legal capacity and legal education is a way to do so. And finally, six, the ticket for admission into these scholarly debates, into co corporate law firms and other organizations consistent with transnationalization is not evenly distributed, including within individual countries. The diffusion of US, uh, pro, US approaches education markets has helped produce a dichotomy within countries between a mass of law schools, a thousand or more in some countries, and students at a few elite law schools open only to a very select group. Those who benefit must have a background that allows them to learn English, excel in standardized tests, following which then they can pursue elite careers. So I'm gonna now turn to my friend, Bryant, followed by Sweta. Thank you, Bryant. Okay, thank you, Greg. I think Greg actually covered the book very well and I'm bravo. And, uh, but I wanted to make one observation that I can't resist is that this uh, legalist empire or the anti-imperial imperialism, the major figure associated with that is Elihu Root, the founder of this organization. So that's a nice kind of aspect to that. I thought I would just very briefly, if you start with the framework that Greg mentioned of, you know, legal revolution, you could say that in the world, we're all competing to have our ideas ascendant and our ideas to shape the rules of the game. But the, the legal revolutions that have an impact, you know, that move from one place to another and have an impact come behind the structures of power that exist globally, which can change over time. And the revolution we are talking about here is one that is grounded in uh, neoliberalism, the spread of corporate law firms, free trade, privatization, all these things that gave in part corporate law firms a major role globally, along with NGOs that are legally oriented, but play a much smaller role, we can say. And depending, it provides an opportunity because law professions everywhere are hierarchical and very slow to change. And so you could say that, that the legal profession in India, Korea, name lots of examples, Brazil, slow to adapt to this legal revolution. Their hierarchies are still very much what they were. And it provides an opportunity for people armed with this expertise to say, we're going to challenge you. And one way we're going to challenge you is by this global gold standard of legal education that has high prestige. And we're going to use it to try to make a place for us. It succeeds or doesn't succeed, depending a lot on who are the allies for this. And so I will give just one example. There are many in the book. When the idea of JDs replacing the bachelor's law degree in uh, Japan and Korea started first in Korea, then it migrated to Japan. Japan was the first to enact a very dramatic reform where they were trying to make the JD the dominant law degree. Korea, it comes back to Korea and the same impetus is there, but it's a little different than Japan. In Japan, the momentum behind it came a little bit after the financial crisis, the Asian crisis, and it basically failed. There was no constituency behind it. Whereas in Korea, the, the very same approach in a way took hold not just because of the power of the ideas or the proponents, but because in fact, the traditional judicial research and training institute, which was the site of entry into the legal profession was deemed to be part of the conservative um, authoritarian alliance between the Chabals, the government, the prosecutors, the law. And the attack on that structure 
made the democracy movement think we need to reform law schools so we can replace this judicial research and training institute as the very conservative uh, source of entry into the legal profession. And because this movement went along with it, you had rather successful, limited in many ways, but rather successful in Korea versus the same thing really deemed universally as a kind of a failure in Japan. Other examples, but I'm gonna let you move to Sveta. Thanks, um, Greg and BJ. That's that that helps actually position our chapter um, within this larger framework. So I'm gonna go straight to both the empirics of it and I think it's poignant that it's the last chapter, right? So that the framework that both of you have set up is this idea of this super meta story. And it makes so much sense that the chapter that Carol Silver and I wrote for this book um, is about students. So it is at the most micro level of how the experience of all of these uh, meta stories actually get experienced by individual students, right? So it's the flip of it. It's who comes to the US, what is coming to the US mean for international students? And what does capital look like for them? Like what does social capital look like for them? How does law get made and created and recursively done by individuals, right? So um, I'm a sociologist by training in addition to my um, legal writing and training. And um, Carol Silver, who's a professor of global law and practice at Northwestern, who I write with as a longtime collaborator, when we started thinking about this project, which is sort of um, follows in a strain of projects on global legal education that we've been writing about, um, it was following a specific trend. So about 10 years ago, the trend in legal education started to mimic what has been a large US trend uh, in higher education more generally in the STEM field, right? So there's a lot of uh, international students in American higher education that's been like a global trend of how to think about American coloniality is in education in a sense, which I think the book tracks so well. Um, but it's but the way in which it's happened in legal education is often by these master's degree programs. So an LLM or a PhD, right? Where the understanding was international students would come to the US, they would get this degree, they would get the credential, and then they have to be off on their way because that is how power got maintained and reproduced in specific ways to think of the international in context and in relation to the hegemony of the American um, dynamic of legal education. But in the last 10 years or so, uh, Carol and I, both because we were just tracking the data and we happened to find this uptick, we noticed that the number of JD students in American law schools who were international started to rise pretty substantially. So we started following the data, we started following the visa stats, and then we realized that actually this was unlike anything that had ever happened before. And the chapter goes into the actual data, and I'm going to refrain from using slides or showing you images, because I think the cool thing about an open access book is that you actually can go and see the data. Um, and, and, and what we find is that there is an uptick of the number of international students who came to the U.S. for an American JD, um, and we were really interested in what that decision meant and followed, right? So we have other we have other uh, articles and chapters on uh, what that actually meant in experience. But this chapter was the first time we actually sat down and thought about what it meant for it as a global process, right? So. Um, you think of students as coming to the U.S. as a mobility process, and that sort of made sort of straightforward sense to us. But it also fits into both Greg's idea of like transnational legal ordering at a very micro level that doesn't get noticed often or doesn't get tracked in that way. Uh, but then it fits Brian and Eve's like larger work of thinking about coloniality and reproduction and power and the ways in which it transfers. And as someone that's you know, been friends with both of them for so long, but also influenced so much by both of their scholarship. It was really fun to play with these ideas within the logic of this chapter, right? Because we were looking at these data and thinking, well, what's, what is actually happening here? Why is it happening the way it is? Um, so we make like a sort of two observations at the trend level, which is that there are more international JD students in top law schools than other minority, a lot of other minority students, right? So we call this the new minority in other other writing. Um, and we struggled with that terminology. How do you think of this as a minority? Is it actually diversity because they come with other sorts of capital? How does that capital transfer to the US? Um, and the second story is that it actually is specifically from certain kinds of countries, right? So there's a global logic, but there's also a local logic of what countries are likely to think 
a, a degree in the U.S. is actually useful to take back or to stay back in. And so trying to think about the global the global and the local logics were helpful in framing what we think of as the global. So when you think of the international, it's not just a specific category. It's sort of like a fungible category that goes back and forth between the local and the global. Um, and, the, and, and one of the findings was that actually it's a big Asia story. We call it the big Asia story because China and Korea are the big senders, or at least they were before COVID changed these data. And so we have a little footnote at the end of it when the book went to press about how much of these trends were actually impacted by ways in which specific countries push these students to the United States. And we come up, because the book was also committed to thinking about theory alongside data, right? Like, and, and, and I think it's all of our own incentives too, to like think about the data, not just as data, but also as a way in which to play with theory. There was a substantive focus to what we also hope has pedagogical and institutional implications. Uh, and we make a four part argument. Um, and MJ, I appreciate you, you know, giving us giving us a sign for that long four part argument, because the four things, as it happens, the, the story that doesn't get said in the chapter is that I was traveling so much during the writing of this, and no one ever talks about the methodology of how chapters get written, but I was flying between Abu Dhabi, New York, and California, sort of nonstop during the writing of this piece, and it ended up being that I would be in airports all the time, and I remember actually writing the outline of this chapter before the UCI symposium that happened, thinking, oh my god, like this is like being stuck on a slow escalator, and that's part of the, I don't know if Greg and Brian even know this story, but that was one of the ways in which the, the theory of this came up, because there were metaphors all around for mobility, so we came up with a four-part logic for what was happening, and it helped us actually categorize our data very well. Uh, we had visa data and, and sort of enrollment data for about a 10-year period, and we were tracking that, but then we had 50 interviews with international JD students that we were also drawing from. So it was like a pretty, um, uh, you know, it was a layered empirical study, but the theory of it came back because we were trying to figure out a way to try and organize the data. And, and one of the ways in which we were thinking of it is there are some students for whom it is a sticky floor, right? And this is an actual stable concept in economics, right? This idea that you can't even get to mobility because the floor is so sticky. In other words, your starting conditions are so hard that you start an LLM and you think you might go to a JD, but the JD is actually not even possible because of a range of circumstances that don't let you get away from the sticky floor. That was the first sort of category of students. The second was the springboard. People who midway through an LLM realized, well, actually this could, a JD could really help change the mobility pattern of what is happening. And I'm going to springboard to it because it could open up all of these categories of ways in which I could experience um, you know, American legal ed or American law or take it back to my country, How, whatever the springboard was, the springboard could do a range of different directions. And then there were students for whom it was a very linear path. They were like, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get into the LLM, that will subvert my reason to like take the LSAT. I can, if I get really great grades, the university might have a program that could flip me into the JD program, and that's what I'm going to do, right? So then it was a very specific logic of how they would jump um, and it was linear. It was a staircase. They knew how long it was going to take. They knew what they needed to get there. And of course, the limits to this is that not all international students are equal. How to think about the international changes from person to person. Um, and, and we talk about that in the piece, but I'm also happy to take that in Q&A. And the final version of this was this idea of the slow escalator, which like sort of got stuck in me because I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you're in an escalator and the person in front of you is on the wrong side of the escalator or doesn't move or is somehow just, you think you're somehow being more efficient in the mobility process because you've jumped on an escalator and it should take you faster. And the most frustrating thing is to have someone in front of you that is actually stopping you from making that mobility happen, right? And we wanted to play with that idea, this idea of like, actually you think you're gonna do something that's totally gonna change the scope of your life. And it sort of doesn't, and it's frustrating, and you don't know how to handle it because you've invested capital into it and you've invested this like sort of reason into imagining your mobility is gonna look different. Um, and, and yeah, so those are the four categories that we sort of started to come up with and so grateful for this book for helping us think through that and the comments that we got at different stages that helped us like flesh this out because it set the agenda, it springboarded us, so to speak, into an agenda of other work that actually 
follows from this. Um, and so I, I'll just say that it made us, I mean, in, in the chapter, we talk about what does it mean to have social capital that is malleable, right? It's different in different contexts, but also what does that then do to changing the kinds of institutions people are part of? Because people aren't living in vacuum. Who you are and where you are changes the kinds of institutions you have. Um, and so to think about the international, not just as who comes to America, right? But to think about what that journey says about America and American law schools and this coloniality that is so brilliantly set up at the introduction um, by Greg and Brian. So thanks for having me be here and share this research. And yeah, look forward to the conversation. Uh so I'm excited to hear so, some um, comments from Rizwan on the book and the project, but I also wanted to take a moment to remind um, everyone in the audience of the Q&A box here. So please do um, send any questions or, or thoughts or comments you might have in the Q&A box. Rizwan. Uh, thank you, MZ. Uh, uh, as I have listened to Greg Bryant and then Shweta, I was thinking that what more can I add? Let me try to do something. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the editors and the chapter authors for their wonderful work. I I'm sure they have written a book that is not going to be read only by those of us who have an interest on globalization of legal education. I feel the book is so rich in its scope, not just its geographical scope, but also its uh, the questions that it has addressed is so rich that it is going to be read by any of us who has interest on legal education. As I think I have, I'm already aware that the Journal of Legal Education is going to publish a set of book reviews on this book. I myself am working on a book review to be considered for publication in the near future. Now, as Greg and Bryant has already pointed out that this book is not just on the contemporary globalization of legal education. It also has covered the historical aspect of it, if not at length, at least at a, at a substantial length. Particularly, when we think of legal education, at times, I guess our thinking gets a little parochial. We think that this is all about the profession, the bench, the bar, and the universities. But once I read the book, it's not that something many of us might not be aware, but we might not have thought through that lens that great people like Mahatma Gandhi or uh, Nelson Mandela, they used their legal education during the colonial era in a way to advance their country's anti-imperial movement. And that partially explains, I guess, why British had a sort of an attitude in some parts of Africa not to advance uh, legal education uh, in a way that could pose some risk to their colonial rule. At least before I read this book, I, have, I was not aware of it at all. Although I knew that Nelson Mandela's, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's had significant roles and they were educated uh, during the colonial era in the UK. But, that the contribution of the authors has made me think in a way uh, which it, in which I at least have not thought before. The other thing that I particularly like about the book is it just does not tell us how legal education is transforming or globalizing, but also explains in a very thorough way that who were the principal actors to bring about the uh, globalization of legal education and who objected to it, what factors were at play. Now, I feel that as the authors have pointed out, contrary to what Tom Friedman has suggested in his very celebrated work, uh, that the world is flat, that the legal education world is not really flat. Uh, as Sertha and some others have addressed that and if I may put it in this way, once you look at the Article 38 of the ICJ statute, it talks about the most highly qualified publicists. And throughout the course of my study as a law student for over two decades, I was always I have always wondered 
that how come it is only a few, uh, a few hundred at best scholars or practitioners who have been cited in ICJ uh, cases or the other leading international courts and tribunals. Law is not a discipline that needs a, uh, extensive uh, laboratory investment. So how could it be that just a few hundred uh, leading scholars have traditionally featured in ICJ and other, other leading course case judgments uh, where they're not sufficiently uh, highly qualified publicists beyond the uh, core uh, scholars, the leading scholars in traditionally Northern countries. So if I um, want to pose further questions for the authors and for us um, in the legal academy, some of the questions that I think at least I have is, how is legal education going to contribute to the rule of law instead of rule by law, as we may see in some authoritarian countries? I know this is not a question that we academics can easily answer because law does not operate on a vacuum. Law operates in a particular political background. There are many social factors at play, but I guess that is a question. The book has addressed it. I'm not, I would not say that the book doesn't address it, but maybe this is a question that is going to be relevant for us for some time. And maybe we have much more room to ponder over this question. Another uh, point that I have uh, noticed right, that although the book is very comprehensive in its scope in terms of the scholars who have contributed to it, if my memory doesn't falter me, I think, uh, all the scholars who have contributed are from the global north or at least large developing countries like Brazil or China or India. And not so much from LDCs. Even a chapter on Bhutan is written by someone very renowned, someone very established with expertise on Bhutan, no doubt. But I would have liked to see in some contribution from a small LDC country, a, a, a small LDC perspective. That's not in any way a criticism of the editors. That's just, again, tells us that the legal education world is not really flat. We have more to do, more to uh, think. Uh, one last point that I would like to make is on the ranking game. I'd call it a game, not to undermine the role of rankings. I think ranking gives us some metrics. Ranking tells us some stories. but. As a scholar or academic in the third world, I often think of ranking as a sort of uh, reinforcement of certain established values. And I'm not saying that the top law schools in, who fare well in the leading rankings, they are uh, there without reasons. But what I wonder, and as a, uh, as a student of international law, I think I have an unfair advantage when I think of my colleagues working on some other aspects of national law. Because for me, it might be a bit easier to get in uh, some leading international law journals because by definition, my uh, research is international and I have a much broader pool to choose from when, I, when it comes to choosing the outlet for my research. But if there is a pressing legal question for my own country and my colleague, working on, let's say, an um, area which is not really global or which is very much national, but maybe a very important question, an existential question for our legal system. I think she or he has a much harder uh, uh, sort of uh, opportunity to get into the leading law journals, no matter how good or bad the article is. So uh, I think as academics, we may ponder more over those things, but that doesn't in any way detract from the quality of the book or its richness. I'm sure it's going to be uh, read widely and cited widely. I have no doubt about that. With that note, um, uh, I thank all the authors and Shweta for her contribution, and I look forward to the questions. Uh, MZ, over to you. Thank you very much, Rizwan. Um, would either the um, co-editors like to respond to um, to anything Rizwan has, has, has brought up? 
Brian, right. I went first last time. You go ahead. <laughs> well, I think on on your the point you made about uh, getting a wider range of uh, authors is something we also deeply feel, and uh, we did what we could, but we know that there's much more that can be said, especially from uh, countries that are developing and don't have, in a way, because of the factors you say, don't have this presence globally that we can find, you know, and it's, they're, they're not, you can't just Google, you know, and, and find their work. And that, that's part of the issue that makes this all uh, stay. And the question about legal education and the rule of law is a, uh, and Greg, Greg may be more idealistic about this than I am. I think that law follows power. And in a new era of authoritarian uh, legality, uh, lawyers will be there, but many will be serving power, which doesn't mean that they are not working as lawyers to tame power, make more rules, make less corruption. But it doesn't mean, it means also that they are not necessarily, some will, but the, 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 the establishment of law will be there serving power ultimately. And on the ranking game, I, I just wanna say what it does is it legitimizes the hierarchies that keep some down and keep some up. Yeah. Great. I'll just maybe follow up with that and just say, um, yeah, you're right, Rizwan, um, in terms, I mean, we have some chapters on, well, uh, uh, you know, the largest country in Africa. So, right, South Africa, in a sense, is a hegemon in Africa. There's a chapter there on Africa, uh, South Africa, written by South African. Um, Chile is obviously a major player in Latin, in the Southern Cone and so forth. And so, in Bhutan, you noted, I'd just say a little bit about David Law, right? David Law, who wrote the chapter, um, actually was the main consultant who went to Bhutan. So he's really writing from his personal experience because Bhutan, they never had a law school, right? So it was a major corporate uh, uh, law, US law firm that fun financed all of this, which is White and Case. And so it sort of illustrates our argument, but it also illustrates you know, the point that it's David Law, who writes the chapter, it's the, it's in a, a now at UVA and a, you know a, a U.S. comparative empirical law professor who was invited in, right? Um, just as um, you know, major British scholars were invited into countries around the world to help with their constitutions. Um, think of Jennings and Pakistan and other countries. Um, which is uh, part of another book that I did on, on these processes um, with Tom Ginsburg on constitution making as a transnational legal order tracing, you know, who are the, the, the agents, right, who are at the center of this. Um, but it's not just, you know, people who are landing into these countries. The book really also talks about who local players are. I mean, in Bhutan, you know, it, it obviously it's a very special type of country, um, being a, a, a royal uh, country, which was you know, got, you know, made, got funding and so forth. But you have, um, you know, the, the book really in this links to Bryant's part, there are going to be lawyers on both sides, right? There's going to be lawyers who are going to be, you know, assisting um, this, those at central power, and there are going to be lawyers who are going to be contesting them. Um, and uh, and so that we we see. So, for example, the chapter on written by a Chilean Javier Cuso on Sela. He's educated in the United States at Berkeley, so he also illustrates her point. Um, got a uh, you know got an SJD. Um, he's now a law professor in Chile, but he he writes on Sela, which is uh, brings together sort of leading constitutional law theorists, sort of advancing a human rights agenda in Latin America, but founded by Yale Law School, sort of the, the elite, you know, professors at Yale Law School uh, that uh, then finances, organizes this and so forth. But they, you know, these, these law professors generally are on the progressive side of conflict within Latin America. You know, they're pushing against authoritarian elites. Um, they'll be central to what's happening in Latin America right now. Um, and so, 
So it, it's, a, it's a complex process. And part of the book is to explain the complexities of who are these agents, what are their different agendas, um, and, uh, and how one, so given the, the structures of, uh, of where financing comes from, for example, um, what sort of influence that has, but at the same time, how you have actors who try to use this knowledge, this know-how um, to contest structures of power. So you see, but as well as those who invest in it to become part of those structures of power, and you have both. Um, and so in that sense, you know, when we celebrate sort of the globalization of legal education or this type of, you know, the development of these law schools, it's it's important to put it in the context of sort of this uh, structural situations within the world. And that's what the book tries to do. I think that's a perfect segue into this really interesting question posed in the Q&A box. Um, Megan Ki Wang uh, would like to know from you a little bit more about how um, the JD degree relates in to um, global power of, of countries outside of the US. And she particularly um, mentions the Confucian tradition um, in East Asia, where the legal profession isn't necessarily correlated with legal power because it doesn't um, have high status um, under that uh, philosophical system. So engaging in the legal profession doesn't necessarily bring power. So she, she's curious, especially about your case studies of Japan and South Korea, and why might it be that they would um, or have emphasized um, the U.S. style JD degree, given these background um, philosophical principles? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great point, but I'm going to hand it right back to Bryant, because Bryant, this is central to some of Bryant's and Sueta's arguments uh, in terms of, obviously, it would be a mistake to only view the, all of this, these developments in terms of only legal professionals. There are other professionals out there. So Brian, I turned it over to you. And I turned it to Sveta for her, her response. I was actually going <clears> to... <throat> there are a couple of things that I think are interesting about the question. Great question, Megan. Thanks again for that. Um, I think there's two things, right? You can study the profession as isolated from the power and the ways in which it changes legal education beyond the markets these people move into, right? So it's not just that uh, there, are there are sort of local logics of what the profession looks like. And then, uh, you know, Brian Neeb's work and Carol Silver's work um, and my work at, in different ways shows how, you know, when you return with the JD, you're also returning because your local market has changed over time, right? So you're returning not to the old version of what these local contexts look like, but you're going back to White and Case in this market. After 1991, so many of these markets started to change and become international in a range of hybrid ways. Um, and so what they were returning to was not the legal profession as it was once remembered, but sort of this more um, corporatized um, version, you know, imbued by capital. And I'm and I and I'm thinking of law firms as one example of it, but there are other ways in which this extended. Uh, but power then was translating into local versions of those power that were now hybridized by the colonial logics of US capital and US power. And so that the the JD did translate and had very different, I mean, I, I, in, in a piece like I wrote 10 years ago, I call it the halo advantage of like these degrees, right? Like it's not so much whether it actually helps you practice law better, but it's the assumption that if you've gone abroad, then you have some capital that is recursively different. And um, I just I just think the way in which law follows power in this way is sort of useful to think about at that individual level because it builds up structures that didn't exist before. So it's both true that these countries aren't, you know, didn't have respectable legal. I mean, India, for example, follows very similar logics, but is even less um global in a sense than both the examples of Japan and Korea. But it's worth thinking about what the US systems of power do to change those hierarchies. And I'll just add a little word on Confucianism in the sense that uh, the uh, the legal profession, you know, with very uh, difficult bar exams in Korea and Japan, was almost built to draw on that sort of Confucian scholar uh, individual to give the same legitimacy that went to those who were able to pass the civil service exams mm -hmm. in the past. And indeed, I interviewed someone in, in Korea who said that in fact, 
those who were passing the bar um, uh, under the Japanese empire were often those who came from long histories of families that would pass the civil service exams. So the history of kind of studying, reproducing elites through that kind of legitimacy uh, got built in to the legal profession as it was being created. Super. Um, there's another comment. Uh, I think it's more of a comment than a question in the in the in the Q and A box. Um, Emmanuel Abagunern um, would like to know whether you're really focusing on legal education um, uh, as per uh, as it pertains to municipal law or international law. And here I'm, th I'm reminded of Anthea Roberts' book talking about the um, different way the international law is is taught around the world. And he's curious whether you're focusing on um, the differentiation there or whether it's really on um, the export of uh, municipal level law. Um, does anyone want to briefly comment on that? Sure, I'll come out in two ways. One is, um, one answer is both. And the second answer is you can't actually, the two are fused. Um, and so, you, um, part of the argument, at least in my work and the book, is that, that you don't, you should, they're not distinct systems. Um, so let me say, first of all, how the both, there, you know, a lot of it is, is about municipal law, but there are two chapters, one by indeed Anthea Roberts, um, who um, you know, put a lot into the conference as well, which is on the construction of international law as a transnational legal field. And it builds from her, her larger book, um, and it talks about these different models and contests. And so how, how is what we understand as international law, not something which is just out there, but is actually something which is constructed by agents and through education and, and, and by studying the flows of students and professors, you can trace this construction of what international law is. A second chapter is by Mikhail Madsen, who runs um, I courts, the study of international judiciary in Copenhagen. And Mikhail traces sort of the, the biographies and histories of those who are on the international judiciaries. Where do they study? Where do they come from? What influences how they, uh, it, to take from Anthea, how they see or frame what international law is? Um, and so those two chapters directly focus on one on international law through looking at the flows of, of uh, students and professors and the other looking at in an international institutions, in particular, the international judiciary. Second, just in terms of transnational legal ordering, um, there's international law is everywhere, right? International law involves you know, international trade law, international investment law, international hard and soft law norms for the conduct of business, um, bankruptcy law, finance, human rights, what shows up in a, in, a, in, a, in a country's constitution, which is to constitute the framework for governance within a national system. The, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has more impact on the human rights listed in national constitutions than any other document. And that is empirically uh, traced and shown, uh, including in a recent article by, uh, well, in our last book on, on constitution making. So, so it, it'd be a mistake to think of uh, municipal law as something which is completely distinct from international law. And so part of legal ed, thinking in terms about legal education is that it both has implications for municipal law, but also how municipal law is shaped, shape can recursively implicate, especially municipal law in the relative core, the United States and so forth, what appears in international law. And in turn, how international law, be it hard law or soft law norms have implications for what becomes national law and practice at the local level. Great, thank you. So I'll uh, interpose a, a question here, and then, and then, if we have time, um, 
I'll turn it back over to Rizwan for, for a last comment or question. Um, so it, one of the really interesting things about the framing of the introduction and some of this discussion here has been about the sort of long sweep of history and how um, there's a, a story about imperial power and colonialism and, and so forth that stretches back quite far. And we're, and we're looking at a snapshot um, in that longer history. And, um, and in fact, you, you say, you know, the US, the zenith of US hegemonic power was really in the late 90s and the early 2000s thousands and certainly the literature seems to support that that conclusion um I'm curious from your vantage point um having worked on this project um what your prognostication might be about where the future is bringing us um if you look 20 50 years down the road are we looking at uh, multipolarity a, a retreat to hegemony um, in, in certain regions of the world who are the exporters and importers do you have any sense of, of where this story is leading us I have to say one word. I have a, a another book that came out this year, a monograph called um, Emerging Powers um, and the World Trading System, the Past and Future of International Economic Law, which tries to trace what impact, if any, will is and will China, Brazil, and India have in this particular area. But um, clearly, empires change, um, law changes, power structures change, and we are at a moment in history where we are seeing significant change and challenge. Bryant, you want to take it from there, from Sueta? I'll just add one word, which is it's it's not inevitable that legalist arguments will count in uh, future hegemonic uh, global orders. Um, it's not just that international norms will will change with different power structures poured into them. It can be that with nationalistic regimes, et cetera, it could be that law becomes something that is an after the fact, uh, you know, gloss on something that takes place under a different, even, you know, the, the role of economists, you know, is something that we talk about a little in the book, but the role of economic legitimacy as, as compared to legal legitimacy already is, dominant in many parts of the world. And I'll just add that that might then have a trickle down effect on the kinds of people that are interested in going to law school, right? Just to go back to this point of like, why do we actually go get a law degree if what lawyers can do has changed to the kinds of ways and as you know, we predict will change, uh, will continue to change. It's going to change who's going to want to come in. And, and I think as legal educators and people that are thinking about legal education, both from the supply and the demand side, paying attention to both of those dynamics is going to be crucial going forward. So now I'll turn it over to Rizwan for, for a last comment and, and question before we uh, close out the session. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I pose my question, let me clarify. Uh, I have great respect for Professor Law. I am aware of his expertise, and uh, in a way, I can claim that he is a friend of mine. It was in no way to imply that he didn't have the pedigree or the connection with Bhutan to write. It was just it was a uh, great question. <laughs> it was, it was just question. to it was just to say that in a way the globalization of legal education it still has its uh, core and peripheries, and maybe there is not enough representation from the peripheries. And that has nothing to do with the editors or with uh, Professor Law. Now, um, one interesting point that I think we haven't really uh, presented to, uh, this evening, but it's a very good point that the authors have made, is that there's a paradox here. The core or uh, the global north hasn't really always transplanted their standard. It has worked the other way around as well. For example, I think they have very nicely presented the case of Brazil, that how the law schools there by globalization, they have built the capital to contribute to international policy debates. Now, if I may pose my last question, my uh, question would be that, do you see any role of legal education in minimizing the impact of social capital and sort of uplift the Im impact of meritocracy, not just in the law schools or in legal profession, but in the greater society. Uh, I know we are out of time, but maybe any thought from any of the authors. Thank you. I think uh, Sveta could talk about the efforts to really have the, uh, the Dalits advance, you know, lacking any kind of social capital, but creating 
um, representation in the top law schools and how it's success, but also failure. It's very tough to do that, to flip the social capital in certain ways. It is telling that we're talking in the light of the, the loan forgiveness scheme that just came out yesterday. I think it's so poignant that we're having this conversation of how to change structures, right? Because it can't just be with inclusion. It has to be a breaking down of the structures that have these pre-existing logics of what hierarchy looks like. And that's so hard to do, which is why this work on like how reproduction of hierarchy keeps you know, working on itself is so important to keep paying attention to. I want to it's 10 to so I feel like we could we could talk we could talk about this for the next you know two hours and talk about how we unequal the world is but I'll I'll start by saying the round of thanks and then hand it over to Brian and Greg uh, ditto thanks I really appreciate you putting this together and I've enjoyed this very much likewise so I don't know who is going to wrap up Reese one were you going to wrap up and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone this is a really rich rich discussion um, and opportunity for us to, to talk about our book. So thank you. It has been a pleasure to be with you. I'm sure uh, MZ can conclude. MZ. <laughs> yeah, thank you to everyone in the room for, for sharing this really rich work with us. And I'm sure um, those in the audience, like myself, are um, have an even more interest in, in spending more time with this work. Um, so thank you to everyone um, who's joined us today um, for this and, and have a good day to all.